Greetings from Liverpool. Uh, my name is Colin Foley, as Claire said. I'm the training director for the ADHD Foundation, the largest patient-led um, ADHD neurodiversity charity in the whole of Europe, and we're based in Liverpool. Um, it's my pleasure today to be presenting uh, this uh, webinar for you about understanding and supporting girls with ADHD. The ADHD Foundation has worked with the Witherslack Group um, for a number of years, and it's a really uh, important and valued partnership uh, with us, and we um, are very very happy always to contribute to the excellent program that the Witherslack group do of training sessions for parents, carers um, and professionals. Um, on the slide there you can see my email address, you can see our website address and you can see our Facebook and Twitter addresses. So if you want to contact me if you think of any questions in three days or three months um, or you'd like further information about ADHD and um, then please um, access any of those uh, resources. Okay so um, Hold on to your hats, everyone. We've got 45 minutes to talk about girls with ADHD. Well, I could talk for about 12 hours about this and not stop. We're not going to cover everything in 45 minutes. Um, Claire and I were just chatting a minute ago about maybe, you know, that we, we need to maybe do a follow-up session or a podcast to really develop some of these ideas uh, further. But we're going to have a good go and we're going to um, get stuck in um, with this. Um, can I just tell you something, though, before we start? Something you might be interested interested in. Um, on the 17th of November, um, we, we are doing a webinar with a woman called Susie Rowland, and it's free. Earlier this year, Susie um, sent me a, a book that she'd written called Send in the Clowns and asked me to review it. And I was so pleased with, the, with this book. I thought, you know what, we, we're go I'm going to have to do something about this. So it's a, it's a conversation between me and her. Um, and it's about, she's got a son, not a daughter, but you know, it's about her journey as a parent to get really good provision for her son in education. He's got autism and ADHD, and the book is really interesting. So if your daughter has that dual diagnosis, you might be interested in that. She talks a lot about something called rejection sensitivity that you might have heard of. Children with ADHD or autism who find criticism quite difficult um, or rejection quite difficult and have uh, overwhelming reactions to that. And she talks about how she manages that with her son and um, but also she talks about neurodiversity and black and minor minority ethnic communities in the UK and not many people are talking about this at the moment so it's another reason why we, we want to get her in so if you're interested in any of that as I've just said it's free and um, I'm going to send these slides to Claire so these the link that you can see on the slide there will be up on the Witherslack uh, website so please join in it's seven till half eight at night and it's completely free okay Right, what I love about presenting um, um, webinars for the Witherslack group is, is that the audiences are always really, really mixed. And I know that, you know, there'll be some of you whose daughters have had their diagnosis for ADHD for a long time. You very, you know a lot about ADHD, uh, you're very well informed and you've just come onto this call to get a few more ideas to see what my take is on it. Um, but there'll be some of you who are right at the start of your journey with your daughter's ADHD. Maybe you've just even just beginning to think, to, to think my daughter might possibly have ADHD. Maybe somebody said it to you, a school maybe. If that applies to you, then we, we haven't really got the time today to really go into all of the diagnostic criteria of what your daughter would have to present to get a diagnosis. If you want information on that or real detailed information on ADHD, ADHD itself, I'm going to talk a little bit about it this morning, then please go to our website. On the screen there, you can see a couple of other resources that I would recommend. Uh, if this is right at the beginning of your journey to find out about what ADHD is, and to uh, and to think about how it might present and affect uh, girls and young women. Patricia Quinn, Ellen uh, Littman, uh, both with um, women with ADHD on YouTube. Um, we are really accessible if you'd rather access, watch something as opposed to read uh, something. Can I also recommend this woman to you, um, um, an old friend of the ADHD Foundation? Um, I'll be honest, I think um, Dr. Sandra Cooey, great name, isn't it? Um, is the, um, I would say, the, the world's leading expert on girls, women, and ADHD. She runs the Centre for Adult ADHD at the University of Amsterdam. Now, she made a really good film this year, um, on, and it's on YouTube. It's called Girls, Women, and ADHD. 
And it's about looking at ADHD in girls and women right across the lifespan. So everything from puberty, pregnancy, the menopause. I know there's not many of you who've come on this call today because you want to talk to your daughter about the menopause. But if you're interested in how ADHD might affect women right across the lifespan, or indeed if any of you are women with ADHD yourselves uh, on this call, then Please, I, I mean, it, 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 uh, it was a webinar made for psychiatrists, so it's a little bit medical, but I'm not a psychiatrist uh, and I could, I could relate to it really, really well. But Google her and look at some of the work of Sandra Cooey, looking at the lifespan experience of girls and women with um, ADHD. Okay, so let's get stuck in everyone. So uh, what is ADHD? I'm gonna keep this quite pacey because I know that so, some of you um, will, um, will be very aware of this. Um, but I just wanna say a bit of a health warning at this point. Everything that I'm about to say to you in the next 45 minutes about girls and young women also applies to boys as well and many, many areas as well of this, okay? And we have to be very careful that we don't make sweeping statements about ADHD. I always remember a teacher saying to me once, um, oh, girls have inattentive ADHD and boys are hyperactive and impulsive. Well, that's just not true. Okay, I was a teacher for 25 years. I've taught my fair share of very hyperactive, very impulsive girls. And there are boys that I taught who are inattentive and, um, and not particularly hyperactive or, or impulsive. So we must be very careful not to go down the road of thinking girls are like this and boys are like this. There's much more of an overlap within the presentation of ADHD. But there are certain key issues that we can talk about when we talk about girls uh, and young women with ADHD. The first point I want to make is we are long overdue a change of this title, aren't we? Are you sick of talking about ADHD the, with the negativity in that language, deficit, disorder? I want to get rid of the word disorder completely. Your daughter is not disordered. She has a difference in the way in which her brain functions. And that presents her with some real opportunities and, it, um, uh, and real positive qualities to ADHD, but it can also present her with a series of challenges uh, and difficulties in her life. But it is a difference. It's not a disorder from a norm. It's just a part of, hu of human uh, cognitive development and ADHD has been around forever. Dyslexia has been around for longer than people could actually read and write. Okay, it's just a part of being human, but it's not. It's not an attention deficit. If anyone says to you, your daughter can't pay attention because she's got ADHD, you know, don't you, that that is absolutely not the case. The term that I would prefer uh, instead of deficit is dysregulation. And that means uh, children and young people who have difficulties um, task initiating, if you like, getting themselves ready and in a position to do an activity. You know as well as I do how much your daughter might put things off or procrastinate or leave things to the last minute, which is a um, classic um, trait of ADHD. And then while she's got going on an activity, it's the ability for her to maintain and sustain her attentional system through that activity to completion. So it's much more of an attentional dysregulation than a deficit. Hyperactivity is fascinating, isn't it? It's, it comes in two parts, motor hyperactivity, movement, physical movement, and cognitive hyperactivity. Children whose minds are going very, very fast, okay? They can move between different subjects. That presents incredible opportunities in some places. I was a drama teacher for 25 years with teenagers. I, my classroom was full of kids on their feet, talking, moving, the fast generation of ideas, doing improvisation. Young people with ADHD thrived in that environment, okay? so. Don't always think of these things as a negative. They also produce certain opportunities in an educational and professional context for your daughter, okay? But hyperactivity is interesting because one of the main issues that we've got with girls and young women in the UK right now is that we are missing so many of them from an ADHD diagnosis and particularly primary aged girls, okay? And one of the reasons is is that they might be moving in a different way than the boys. Okay, so the way in which, this is why people think, well, girls with ADHD aren't hyperactive. Well, 
absolutely they are, but it might be in a different way that is a little bit more socially acceptable and not as difficult or distracting in classrooms, and therefore people think, well, it's not ADHD. And I'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. So ADHD is a neurodevelopmental condition. It's also what's called highly comorbid. That means that if your daughter has an ADHD diagnosis, there is a 60% chance that she might have other conditions as well. And in my experience, as an educator for 25 years and now as a training director for an ADHD charity for the last six years, I know that the vast majority of children and young people who are neurodiverse in the UK at the moment have a single diagnosis instead of a dual diagnosis. I was in a primary school yesterday. I said, how many, how many youngsters have you got with an ADHD diagnosis? The Senko said 12, all boys, interestingly. Okay. I said, how many of those have got a dual diagnosis? He said two. Okay. It should be the other way around. And why? It's because sometimes I know what it takes to get an ADHD diagnosis. I know how difficult some of you, you know, that journey was for some of you. And I completely understand if you think, well, that's it, I'm done now. I'm not gonna look at anything further. I'd implore you if you are thinking that there might be other things going on in the mix for your daughter is to, is to explore that again you know start the process again in some cases but it's also that people you know particularly teachers or and even parents might look at a child who's got ADHD and think well my daughter's really struggling with their reading well of course she is she's got ADHD or she's you know her handwriting is really illegible she's you know and she doesn't seem to be developing in terms of handwriting because she's got ADHD well it could be the case but it could also be that it's because maybe she's got dysgraphia the handwriting difficulty and um, just let me share this with you before I, I go any further this is called the do it profiler this you can see the website uh, on the bottom there you can see the email address and it's a it's a cognitive screening tool you can do it for your daughter you can she can do it herself if she's a teenager you could do it for her um, or yourself or your partner or your friends or any other kids that you've got um, so what you do is you fill out uh, 75 questions they're all multiple choice so it's quite quick it only costs you a couple of pounds to get it on an app right and it gives you a cognitive profile of your daughter it looks right across the span of all the different ways of working okay and you can identify if maybe Maybe there are other issues going on as well as um, her ADHD. Um, I did it for myself a couple of years ago. It came back that I was kind of borderline dyspraxic. Um, and I said to this friend of mine who was, who was an expert on dyspraxia, I said, I haven't got dyspraxia. Um, I, I said, my handwriting's lovely. She said, I've seen you play football, Colin. I think you might have dyspraxia. So it's really, really interesting. It's not a diagnosis of anything, but it might help you to get a real idea of the, um, the, any comorbidities that are going on for your daughter right now because they're highly likely. Um, as you can see on the screen there, you know, the, the symptomology of ADHD, the three main features that we rec everybody recognizes are their inattention, hyperactivity, both motor and cognitive, and I've talked about those two, but also impulsivity, and you might be experiencing this with your daughter, okay? An impaired ability to really think through the consequences of your behavior, your actions, uh, or your words. But there are also three other features of ADHD that I really want to draw your attention to that, in my opinion, we don't talk enough about. And you might recognize this with your daughter. One is called executive functioning. And I can't stress enough the importance of thinking about this in terms of educational success. Executive functioning is your, your, the brain's ability to plan and organize. And the second one is what's called working memory. Are you finding that you're saying things to your daughter and she's forgetting things? You know, or you're helping her with homework and she's doing it and she's everything's fine. And then when you come to do a similar piece of homework in a week's time, whatever, she's having real difficulties with it. It's a, it's a common feature of ADHD. Working memory is the ability to hold information in your brain temporarily that enables you to do the activities that you've got to do. 
And the last feature, excuse me, <laughs> and the last feature we have is what's called emotional dysregulation. And these are young people who uh, might have difficulties uh, understanding their emotions, expressing their emotions. They might be expressing emotions in a very extreme way. Emotional uh, reactivity, it's sometimes called, or hyper um, arousal, other people call it. Um, so it's difficulties really regulating. So you might find, is your daughter, you know, uh, have an angry outburst, for example? Does she have low resilience? You know, gives up easy, gets upset easily. Um, also, does she freeze? and shut down uh, is another feature of this uh, when things get difficult and when she feels quite anxious. So that everyone was uh, the very very quick um, um, explanation of what ADHD is for those of you who are right at the start of your journey. Just let me just explain quite quickly what I mean by executive functioning and I'll do this uh, by giving you an example. Right? I want you to think everyone on the last day off you had, right, and you had a number of errands that you had to run and you had a set amount of time that you had to do it in. So what do you do? So you get yourself up, you get washed, you get dressed, you have your breakfast, you sat at your breakfast table and you're gathering around you all of the things that you need to do the errands that you've got to run. Your purse, your credit card, your wallet. That's called task initiation. You can see it there, number one. Getting yourself in a position with all of the right stuff that you need to do what you have to do. And then number two, whilst you're doing that, simultaneously, you are controlling certain things about you. So your impulses, your emotions, and your attentional system. So for example, it's a day off. So your impulse is to lie on the sofa all day and watch a box set on Netflix. But you don't do that because you've got errands that you've got to run. You might be feeling angry about something that's going on for you. You might be upset about something. You put that on hold. It's called emotional self-regulation because I haven't got time to do that because I've got these errands to run. And then what do you do? You start to plan. Planning, prioritizing, goal setting, time management, organization, sequencing. Which shop do I go to first? You know, where is it in relation to the next shop, etc.? working out your time that you've got, numbers three and four. Whilst you're out and about, something changes. You get stuck in a traffic jam. You have to queue for petrol. Uh, the shop's closed, okay? You have to change what you're doing in real time because the nature of the situation has changed. It's called flexibility. Some people call it f um, flexible working. Set shifting is the ability, particularly in classrooms, to move quickly between different what's called modalities. So, for example, some children who you know could read something quickly and then go and write something and then go back and read something. Youngsters with ADHD sometimes find that difficult. So the ability to be flexible. And all the time while you're out and about, you're constantly monitoring where you're up to. You know, what time is it? Have I still got to do everything? OK, uh, you know, um, how much time have I got left? You're monitoring the, your progress as you go along. I lost count of the number of young, young people that I said when I was a teacher with ADHD, where are you up to in this task? And they'd look at you completely blank because they had an impaired assessment of it as a whole thing. And the last one is working memory. As I mentioned before, while you're doing all of this, you're holding all of this information in your brain. If you are seeing any difficulties in any of these areas with your daughter right now, then it's very, very common with ADHD. And I'm going to talk hopefully a bit later um, about what we can do to support the executive functions um, of our daughter. ADHD now comes in three types. All right. I'm a little bit wary of these types because I think these types move and they change and they shift in some youngsters, not all of them. Um, but look at the top one, um, predominantly inattentive type. This used to be called ADD, Attention Deficit Disorder. Um, if you're in Scotland or Northern Ireland, um, then the ADD diagnosis is still given, um, less so now in England uh, and Wales. But it means youngsters whose principal presentation is inattention 
that and, and less so is impulsivity and hyperactivity and for a long time a lot of girls and young women were diagnosed in in this way it's becoming more so the case now that more and more girls are being diagnosed as the bottom one you can see there the combined type we recognize that girls with ADHD are hyperactive and impulsive it's just that it presents in a different way let's talk about um, incidents um, how many people have got ADHD because one of the main issues with girls is that we are as I mentioned before under diagnosing them significantly the World Federation of ADHD produced a statement this year, um, and this was this was created by 80 eminent academics and researchers from 26 countries across six continents. And they agreed that the incident rate of ADHD for children and young people was 5.8%. Sadly, they didn't you know, look at the current rates between boys and girls. Adults, 2.9%. Now you might find this interesting. It doesn't mean that you know fewer adults they've all grown out of their adhd or they've all been cured you know as well as i do that you don't grow out of adhd you live with adhd all your life but it shows you doesn't it the number of adults who learn to manage their adhd brilliantly and live very successfully and therefore it's not an impairment in their life and therefore they wouldn't get a diagnosis as an adult ADHD because they're managing it so well. So there's lots and lots of positives. You know, there are many, many people living incredibly well with ADHD and indeed thriving. It particularly, I could tell you stories all morning about people I know who are thriving with their ADHD, particularly in a professional context. If people understand their ADHD, if they accept it for themselves, if they learn to self-manage it and they get themselves into the right professional context, they can absolutely um, thrive with ADHD. Look at that second point down on the slide. So our rates of diagnosis are really different between boys and girls, but for adults, it's much closer, which tells us, doesn't it, that a lot more women are coming to their diagnosis as an adult. Why are we diagnosing less girls than boys? Well, there are a few reasons that I want to, that want to explore with you this morning. The first one is that they, we've had a historical connection with ADHD, and it's exactly the same with autism, that these are male conditions. In fact, if you've heard of Asperger's, you might have heard of the Asperger's syndrome. Uh, there was a guy called Hans Asperger's who was an eminent researcher in autism in the first half of the 20th century. He didn't even work with girls and women. All of his research and all of the assessments that he created were all done with boys and men in mind because he thought that um, girls and women couldn't get autism, which of course we know is ridiculous. All right? um, so we have that historical connection. I still read all the time uh, people writing adhd is a condition that affects more boys than girls and that's not true it's a condition which is diagnosed in more boys than girls which is not the same thing and as i mentioned before some of it is about the way in which it can present in girls so if girls are less physically hyperactive but their hyperactivity presents for example in excessive talkativeness or excessive sociability or excessive impulsivity that's more socially acceptable and it means we can miss them but the really important point that i think really underlies why we diagnose girls less is because of masking and suppression and girls can be incredibly skillful at this and you might be noticing this in your daughter for example um, boys do it as well of course let's not forget that but if i had a fiver for every parent i've spoken to who said i want to pursue an ADHD diagnosis for my daughter, but the school won't support me because the school are saying there's no issue because they're not thinking about it or because that little girl is masking her symptomology so much. Okay, so what's the, what's the thinking? Girls have fewer symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity than inattention. Well, in some, obviously, but in others, not at all. It's just that it presents differently than you can see on the second point there on the slides. Girls might be fidgeting, but they're not getting out of their chair, for example, and running around the classroom. Some of them obviously will be. Or the way in which ADHD might present more uh, frequently in girls is the things that the third point there, down, daydreaming. 
disorganization, forgetfulness, right? Excessive talk, interrupting others, you know, acting on impulse much more. And the issue with girls is because people don't, are not thinking ADHD, they put it down to other reasons. She's got behavioral problems. She's got learning difficulties. She's in very emotional or oversensitive. So very, very quickly, girls can get categorized in other ways. And it's not just from teachers as well. It can be from parents. There's been some um, some research that I found um, just uh, over the weekend, um, but that look at, you know, parents who, and you might have been down this, this journey yourself. You might have thought, I mean, I've known um, very, very experienced um, educational professionals who've got daughters with ADHD who and are very, very knowledgeable about ADHD who said, I can't believe I missed it in my daughter for so long. I didn't even think about it. If you've had that experience, please, please don't beat yourself up. Um, you know, we, we, we don't know what we don't know. And, you know, you're in the situation you're on in now as opposed to you were in then. So please put it, it and, you know, hopefully um, some consolation to you that, you know, it is a common issue with girls as well. So, you know, a certain amount of parents have perceived ADHD um, as a male condition. But there are definite risks here. If we diagnose girls later, then the longer that they go unsupported, unrecognized and untreated can have significant impact. In fact, the majority of girls who get their ADHD diagnosis in their childhood is when they're teenagers. And it's because issues like anxiety, depression, eating disorders, self-harm start to present in that young woman. And then that's the reason why she starts to, you know, see a doctor or a pediatrician. And then hopefully she gets in front of a medical professional who knows something about ADHD. If you've got your daughter diagnosed as in a, and if, you know, young, five, six, seven, eight, you're doing really well. And I, I applaud you, um, you know, because, uh, you know, that's the exception rather than the rule, sadly, in the UK um, at the moment. Um, I don't want to be really miserable um, or bring you down, or but I just wanted to share with you just some of the uh, the issues that can happen the the later we diagnose the risks for example of uh, of mental health issues self harm that piece of research there which i thought was really interesting um from 2019 which um which came out of a number of interviews with girls with adhd and i read a, a number of them and it was so sad to read them because what happens particularly with girls much more so than boys, is girls internalise, boys externalise. That's the cliche that you might have heard. Boys can do this as well, of course. But when girls internalise, they blame themselves. So, you know, without a diagnosis or an explanation of ADHD, girls can get into that trap of, well, it's me. I'm stupid. I'm silly. I can't make friends. You know, I'm no good at school. And then that internalised self-blame then creates uh, much more anxiety. The other reason uh, we can be missing girls is that when the girl, when girls do present to doctors with anxiety, for example, um, then that can often be confused uh, and therefore anxiety can present very similar to ADHD and therefore you know there's if you go on ADHD Twitter and I would absolutely recommend it if you're interested in ADHD it's full of women across the lifespan in their 40s 50s 60s saying you know I was treated for anxiety and or depression for decades and you know been on every anti-anxiety med every antidepressant on the market nothing worked until I got my ADHD diagnosis, I got that explanation, maybe we're treated um, with medication for ADHD, maybe not, but then what we know is that it's always, always better that we know, they'll have that explanation for your daughter. There is some really interesting research going on at the moment, everyone, about the high rate of co-occurrence between ADHD and autism. Uh, some researchers are putting it as high as 60 to 70 percent okay will of youngsters who have autism will have adhd and the other way around that whatever the first diagnosis is it's important as well because masking and suppression is a significant feature of autism for girls as well so it should be that if you are going for a diagnosis for your daughter for adhd is have a look at autism as well just consider it i'm not saying that your daughter's automatically autistic not at all 
all, right? But what we should be doing in the UK is looking at those two things together, particularly for uh, girls. Um, and what we see, that last point on the slide, is what we also see is that some girls their symptoms of ADHD can be more pronounced during adolescence. And I'll come back to that point. But do you know what, everyone? We, we expect a lot of girls, don't we? We put a lot of pressure on girls. Um, I also train in mental health. Um, and over the years, I've, you know, I've, um, all of those studies that have been done about girls, do you remember um, the one that was saying 14 year old girls are in the eye of the storm? No, it's girls aged 16 to 19. And um, so there's been a lot of work, a lot of awareness of, of the mental health of girls. Um, but let's just think about it in terms of ADHD. You know, what do we expect of girls? You know, we expect them to be skilled at relationships. We expect them to be able to interact, to be so what I call socially adept, much more so than boys, don't we? There was a great study in the Netherlands a couple of years ago that, that um, looked at girls and boys with ADHD and autism at school during break and lunchtime. So interesting. A lot of the boys, particularly with autism, would take themselves off on their own. But the girls um, with ADHD or autism, they would flit around for different groups. They would want to interact and want to socialize. So would go over to a group, you know, try and interact, find it difficult, find it, you know, tiring or whatever, move away, then go to another group and they would just move around much more than boys. So there's definite pressures, isn't there, on girls socially, but there's also huge pressure on girls um, in, in education. I mean, I, 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 I'm a, I, I hold my hands up and apologize that I did this when I was a teacher as well. You expect girls to do more, you know, to do well at school. Girls do better overall than boys uh, in education, um, in, in every subject now, um, increasingly. And so we know this, so, so the pressure we put on girls to do well, we also expect girls, you know, to be very, you know, to be competitive and assertive, to be career minded, you know, all of those, those things. And there's a lot of pressure on girls uh, who might have ADHD. Um, what, what one of the um, passions of ours in the foundation is about people in the public eye who who uh, speak publicly about their ADHD and we we've approached and stalked quite a few people and tried to get them to be open and many many more people are, uh, are speaking publicly about ADHD and it's so important that young people have good role models but if you look at the gender ratio of them, the number of women in the public eye compared to the number of men, right? There's significantly fewer women, and I put some amazing examples on the screen there uh, for you to see. It is getting better. Diagnosis rates for girls is getting better in the UK. We're now at three male diagnoses to every one female diagnosis. Things are improving, but not fast enough for me, I'm afraid. OK, let's talk a little bit more, everyone. Hope you're all OK. Hope um, I am. I know it's, this is quite pacey, uh, but there is a, quite a lot that I want to say. And I've got a very little time this morning, but I hope you're all doing OK so far. Please comment um, or, or um, raise questions with Claire in the chat box. And um, let's talk about masking and suppression um, a bit more. Um, I can't stress this enough, how we need to be aware of this. You know, girls much more so, you know, um, are inclined to not want to stand out want to be their friends we all know don't we when your daughter hits adolescence the main influence in her life stops being their parents and carers and becomes her peer group adolescence is a process of experimenting with what it's going to be like to be an adult and 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 understanding yourself and identifying as part of a group socially and that's very very important if you have difficulties with this OK, because maybe of your ADHD, impulsivity or inattention or poor memory, then this can be really significant, especially for teenage girls. And um, what we often hear, I hear this from teachers all the time, and you might have experienced this, is parents who ring up schools and say, my daughter's gone into meltdown is, or is every day as she comes home. OK, and and the teacher's saying, She's great. I had this once um, with a girl. I was absolutely gobsmacked when a parent rang me up and they said um, their daughter, who was in year eight, so she was 12, um, was uh, having, going to, having a meltdown every Tuesday night. And the parents had kind of thought, 
right, this is every Tuesday night, what's going on? And when the daughter finally said, she said it was because she had drama with me first thing on a Wednesday morning. And I was absolutely gobsmacked. She was quiet. Okay, she was, you know, quite a shy girl and she didn't really want to put herself forward, but she was doing okay. She wasn't having any meltdowns or she wasn't, you know, telling me, you know, to stop or go away or anything. She was doing what she was asked to do in the class. And I couldn't believe how much she was suppressing her fear of being in a drama lesson. Uh, and this had gone on for months and months and months before we worked out um, what was going on. Another issue is that, and I don't know if you, you, you're in this situation, is that parents can often do a lot for their children with ADHD. They, they organise them, they are their time manager, they're their housekeeper, their PA, all of those things. They're, you know, they keep their diaries, um, and especially in primary school. So what we find is, is, that, is that primary age girls, you know, if they're all right, if they're bright and they're on the ball and they know what they're doing, they're well supported in school and, they're, and at home, they may well do well at primary primary school and with a lot of parents uh, scaffolding and um, what starts to be difficult is when they hit secondary and there's a lot that's a much more expectation for them to be self-directed um, and to be independent in their learning we've had a couple of cases one a number of cases of of uh, young women who have got through secondary school really really well with the support of parents and teachers and then when they've gone off to university or college then then they're living independently that's when the problems have started to come about and that's when they've got their diagnosis so it can happen right through the school experience if you are in the process of getting an ADHD diagnosis, or if you know, you're on a waiting list or you're thinking about it, please, when you do that assessment, please make it clear to the clinician that, that you know, when they ask you about, has your daughter got problems you know, with executive functioning, with memory, make it clear to them how much support you are giving your daughter. And one of the best things that we can do in an ADHD assessment, and you can ask the school to do this as well, is to involve your daughter in, in the assessment itself, right? Part of the Connors form, for example, which is one of the most popular um, screening mechanisms that, that, that schools use, you know, there is a facility for the child or the teenager to get involved because it's by asking your daughter to talk about her ADHD and making her obviously as comfortable as she can be. Then we can begin to get a grip on, you know, what's it like for you? What's how much internalized? If the teacher's saying, well, she sits there, she's quiet, she, she does what she's told, she, you know, she's doing all right. You know, it's only through talking to your daughter that they'll realise, you know, the amount of difficulties and anxieties that she and fears that she's masking and suppressing. So I'm a huge advocate that um, children and young people are involved in the process um, themselves. OK, uh, right. Ooh, seven minutes to go. OK, um, I just want to talk a little bit about teenagers. If you've got a teenage daughter, um, I, I've talked or uh, I talked before about, um, you know, how the, what we call the relationship imperative, how the peer group becomes very um very important. But I saw this myself as a teacher many times working with, um, you know, 11 to 18 year olds, girls who were very impulsive, very hyperactive, who the other girls thought were quite quirky and full of character in year seven sometime in year eight but then throughout year eight and into year nine it started getting really difficult other girls maybe started moving away from some of the girls certain girls with adhd okay that the, the girl with adhd or the girls that some of the girls that i taught with adhd found it difficult in those social situations excessive talk interrupted impulsivity posts on social media for example it's very common for girls and boys with ADHD to want to socialize with younger children because they can be, you know, as you're probably aware, quite emotionally immature in many ways. There is a developmental delay with ADHD emotionally of about two to three years. So if you've got a 13, 14 year old and you think, you know, she's still, you know, she's still like she was, you know, like a year seven pupil, that's not that it's not uncommon with ADHD. The research shows us that what can happen is uh, in secondary schools, particularly, it can go either one of two ways. You either have the beginnings of perfectionism, and perfectionism can be quite worrying, which is, you know, your daughter spending hours and hours and hours doing work, doing homework, ripping things up when they're not quite perfect, you know, or, you know, um, leaving things to the last minute. 
again, let's not be completely negative about this, okay? I've taught many adults I know with ADHD, talk about hyper-focus, and your daughter might be doing this, where they really focus right at the last minute and can work incredibly well and incredibly successfully in a short period of time when, for example, they're up against a deadline. So it's not always negative. Um, or they go the other way, which is about avoidance work. Okay, uh, lots of complaints of physical complaints, which is often, um, you know, if your daughter is complaining of lots of stomach aches and, uh, for example, is, the, is one of the main um, ones, then that could be her saying, you know, I feel highly, highly anxious. Just on a really serious note here, um, there is uh, some research, uh, quite a bit of research around about risk, particularly for girls with uh, with ADHD um, and autism. Um, online vulnerability, for example, is, is very common, but the research would suggest that girls uh, with ADHD uh, will be having sex at a younger age, more sexual partners, less likely to use contraception, for example, um, higher risk of um, a uh, higher incidence of teenage pregnancy compared to uh, the rest of the population. So there are some significant risks that we need to be aware of. Uh, but one really interesting thing that we have going on in the UK at the moment is that we have significantly fewer girls medicated for ADHD than boys. Now, I'm not here to sell drugs. I don't work for a pharmaceutical company, and I know that many of you will be bringing up your daughter and supporting her incredibly successfully with her ADHD without medication. But we know for some people with ADHD, medication is a critical part of the way in which they manage their, um, their uh, ADHD. So it's interesting that um, Often we find um, girls, for example, who've been unmedicated in primary school, then uh, looking at medication. I would always say that if, you, um, if, you, if you're just starting on your journey with ADHD, medication is one treatment. It shouldn't be the only treatment for ADHD, but it can be one very effective treatment for ADHD. And there is just a myth that I want to dispel with you right now okay which is a myth has arisen because people are, um, people are saying or i've heard people say that because of the increase of estrogen estrogen sorry at puberty right adhd medications are less effective for teenage girls than they are for teenage boys can i just say categorically that this is not true there is no evidence that methylphenidate which is the main drug uh, that is used and you can see a couple of the brand names there is less effective in girls now Again, you might choose not to use medication for your daughter, but I did just want to dispel that. Okay. Um, right, we've got a couple of minutes now to talk about what we can do to support your daughter. And this is where we may be where I think it would be good to have a, a kind of a follow-on um, session or, or a podcast if Claire's interested uh, in doing that, because we've just got a few minutes to talk about this. Um, one thing that I would certainly say is, if you agree with me, I, I believe that all behavior is communication. That one really important point to make is, is, is instead of focusing on the negative consequences of certain behaviors of your daughter, so if she's if she's a bit over, you know, over overwhelming in, um, or controlling in social groups, if she's talking too much, if she's interrupting and that's causing difficulties with friendships, is about looking at, you know, asking your daughter what it is that she's at, what she wants to communicate in that situation. Because obviously your daughter wants to, wants to be involved. She wants to socialize. She wants to, you know, be linked and have friendships. But you know, by looking at well, what you're trying to communicate, what do you want from that situation, then let's look, let's work together and look at ways uh, that we can do that. The language of choice is always much, much more effective with youngsters with ADHD. So you have a choice in this situation, don't you? You could do this, what would be the consequence of this, or you could do that. Thinking about high anxiety, I had loads of success with youngsters with ADHD where I worked out with them their, their physical signs that we could do and I needed to say something to them and I needed them just to calm it a bit or I needed them to sit down or stop talking. You know, instead of drawing everybody's attention to the fact that youngsters uh, got neurodiversity, I always remember this little boy said, I said, what, what, I said, what sign should I do when I just want you to just be quiet and look at me? And he said, do this. 
I said, you're joking, aren't you? I said, I'm not doing that. And he said, oh, please, sir. And do you know what? I did that with three years with this little boy. And it was lovely because every time I did it, we, we smiled and we laughed at each other. And it was a lovely thing. The last thing I'm going to say, everyone, because I'm conscious of time, is, is just the, the, one of the most important things with if you've got a daughter with ADHD is really to prioritise her mental health. Because I can't stress enough the risk, particularly with, uh, with anxiety with girls. You can see the research there, one in three, which is a massive number. And one of the things you can do is well, um, have a look at Kenneth Ginsberg's work on, on YouTube. He's, his interest is about resilience in teenagers. And he talks about the seven C's of resilience. And one of them is called competencies. The more competent you your daughter feels about an area of your life, you know, her life, sorry, if she's a great singer, if she's a great footballer, if she knows everything about dinosaurs, like whatever it is that she's into, the more you develop and nurture and, and share and celebrate that, the more competent she feels in something, the more resilient she can be to the, the real challenges and difficulties uh, that she faces in other areas, particularly around school. If you've not thought about executive functioning or if you're not being um, aware of it, please have a look at it because there's lots and lots of ways in which you can support your daughter, particularly as she gets into adolescence, around planning, organisation and managing the workload of school. Also, Google assistive technology. The market has exploded in the last five years of tech that is out there that will really, really help your daughter to do her homework, to organize herself, apps for her phone, um, for her laptop, you know, that, that can help her to organize, can help her to plan, and um, can, can write essays, you know, help not, not write essays for her, can help her to plan and organize um, writing, uh, for example. I mean, there's so, so it's so exciting what's going on. Um, have a, have a look at the magic pens, uh, which are really, they're not, they're not cheap, but they're really, really effective for helping youngsters, particularly around memory and particularly around organisation and planning. Um, if this is the only session that we do, um, and if you've got to get off now before the Q&A, can I just say thanks very much for engaging with this, taking time out of your busy lives. My very best wishes to you, and I hope your daughter's doing well. Um, and I just would say, you know, ADHD, if you get this, if you understand this condition, if, you, if your daughter learns to accept it and understand it and embrace it and self-manage it for herself, there's no reason why she can't go on to be have a really successful, happy and accomplished uh, adult life uh, and my best wishes to you and your daughters everyone thanks very much thanks colin and um, what a fantastic um presentation we've had so much engagement from everybody who's watching and listening today lots of people saying thank you for you know acknowledging how difficult it can be lots of people saying that you know masking is happening with their child um, and also lots of parents saying similar things about school that they don't seem to think that there are any any problems. So I just wanted to let you know that, you know, we've Great. had a lot of feedback today. And I think Good. certainly um, given the number of questions that are pinging in right now we should probably <laughs> consider doing a follow-up i think it would be really good um so with the time that we have got left i'll try and get through as many questions as we possibly can and um, okay, i'll try to take a note of them um so as i say once we don't get through we'll, we'll try and cover in the follow-up okay so to begin with um, this parent said, it feels like because she isn't throwing tables around the classroom and swearing at teachers and actually is doing quite well in school and meeting academic expectations that she is being overlooked. How can we help her? And can a parent refer their child themselves? Well, what's, what's the name, Claire, of, of the questioner? Do you know? I haven't took the name down, oh, right. I'm afraid. Okay. No, right. sorry. Okay. Oh, sorry. Oh, hi, yeah. Thanks very much uh, for your question. Um, you're absolutely, you're, you know, you're absolutely right, isn't it? If she isn't throwing tables around the classroom, then she get missed. Um, I'm not sure if, um, I'm not sure where you, where you're coming from in terms of does does your daughter have a diag? Oh, I'm assuming she doesn't then, because um, you've asked how can we how can we refer? Um, right. Well, that depends where you live. Um, so. 
um, have I either talked to the Senko, who should know the, the referral process um, for ADHD, um, or at least go on the CC, CCG, the Clinical Commissioning Group website for your area, who will definitely know. But the Senko should know. So in some parts of the uh, in the UK, um, you can just go. You can go to your GP directly. Um, in some places, it has to go through the school. So the school would have to get involved in this. Um, in other places, it has to go through CAMS, you know, Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services. So it depends where you live, really. But I always say to parents, you know, um, especially um, do, girls, is go armed with the information as much as you can. Do your research, you know, look at our website, look at the Witherslack Group website. There's a great online magazine from the States called attitude.com. It is American, but it is really, really good and prolific posting um, about ADHD, lots of information about girls and women. Go armed. I mean, I'm, there are brilliant GPs out there, but there are some GPs who are, have got less knowledge and experience of neurodiversity. Remember, um, a paediatrician has to diagnose your daughter. If you, and if you go down the medication route, a paediatrician manages their medication. Adult psychiatrists diagnose adults. So GPs, you know, kind of hand over that responsibility for neurodiversity. So if you are going to speak to your GP, you know, is really, really stress the executive functioning, organisation, planning, because when you talk about anxiety, for example, it would be very easy for that GP to think, right, then we're talking about a child with a mental health issue and you want her referred for um, a neurodiverse condition. Um, I would suggest keep going. Obviously, keep the relationship with the school positive uh, because you're going to need that relationship if you want if you want the diagnosis because you're going to need the school but is to say you know is to refer the school to any of the resources that I've just said and for you and I mean, I've known many many parents have done this you know ha have educated teachers and senkos about girls with ADHD and just keep going going there and saying you know um this is what we're concerned about. This is what we think might be going on, right? And this is what it's like with girls. You might have exp experience of boys throwing tables, but that doesn't mean that my daughter doesn't have uh, ADHD. Um, I hope that's helpful. The last thing I'd say, of course, is that you did say that your daughter's doing well academically. Well, you know, um, that doesn't just happen. She, if she's got ADHD, she's trying, bless her heart, she's trying really, really hard there and she's having a good go, isn't she? And also you are doing something really, really well because again, that doesn't just happen. If your daughter's got ADHD and she's doing well at school, that's because of the quality of the support you're giving her as, at home as well. Um, but look at your particular area and stick, stay in there, really. Keep talking to that school about girls and ADHD. Good luck with this. Thank you. Thanks, Colin. OK, I'll quickly go on to the next one. Um, so is it common for girls to actually be quite good at certain executive functions, but really struggle with others? Great question. You know, what? one of the things that I, I hope that I stressed in the webinar is that, you know, every child is unique um, and every child um, is different and then neurodiversity will present differently. It is definitely the case that with executive functions, you can have, depending on the condition that you've got um, and the, the, the type of presentation that there is of, of your ADHD, that there can be certain strengths in certain areas. I mean, the, the obvious one is with a dual diagnosis of autism. Um, youngsters who have that presentation of what's called high functioning autism, which is not a term that I like, particularly what used to be called kind of Asperger's, can have certain definite certain skills in verbal work, memory skills, for example, organization, and can be kind of very good memory of certain information and certain facts. Um, but so it is absolutely the case. It will be interesting to know what what you know what what things your daughter is doing well in, uh, and what things um, that she's you know that she's struggling with in terms of her executive functions. But yes, absolutely, you can see different um, different um, abilities and competencies in different executive functions. And also, it's about you know it's about your daughter's lived experience as well, isn't it? It's about the support you've given her. It's about her experience of school um, so far. You know, all the genetic makeup might mean that her ADHD might present in different way and remember 
ADHD, like every neurodiverse condition, is a spectrum condition. And therefore, you can get a diagnosis of mild ADHD, sounds a bit weird, doesn't it, to extreme and severe ADHD. So it could be that your daughter is towards that milder end uh, of the spectrum in some ways. But yes, absolutely, uh, there can be some, some executive functions. And if she's hyper-focusing, on something, if she's, for, uh, you know, if she's really into to something, and she her memory for that that topic, right, or that subject could be uh, could be brilliant. Um, and similarly, you know, um, if she's doing activities around that particular thing or activity or subject that she's hyper focusing on, she might be very well organised. She might manage her time very well. You don't switch hyper focus on and off, right? The issue with ADHD is often why youngsters struggle to engage, struggle to get started and struggle to keep their attention is immediate engagement. Engagement. If they're really interested in it, they will really have a go and get stuck in and do it. And so you might see executive functioning in that area being very, very positive. When she's not interested or immediately interested in something, then you might see difficulties with memory, time management, organisation that weren't there when she was talking about football or singing or swimming or whatever she's of, you know, um, science or whatever she's into, for example. Hope that's that's answered the question. But yes, is the answer to that. Thanks, Colin. OK, so I've got another question here um, from a parent who says, how do I motivate or encourage my 11 year old daughter to do things for herself? You know, things like brushing her teeth and eating and drinking and um, showering, things like that, without me constantly nagging or, or scolding her daily to get these things done. Thanks very much uh, for the question. Um, OK. Um, one thing that, that um, we know about ADHD is that um, it's caused by what's called dopaminergic dysregulation. So that means that there's a dysregulation in the transmission of dopamine around the brain. Now, dopamine has a number of different functions within the brain. Um, it has a role in focus and concentration. It's a pleasure-based neurochemical. So dopamine's emitted then, but it's also a reward-based neurochemical. Um, so what we know in education, for example, is that rewards work with youngsters with ADHD. And what's worrying me a lot at the moment is a lot of schools are moving away from rewards. Um, sorry, I'll, that's a bit of a digression, uh, which worries me. But it could try a strategy of a reward for example, um, so you have a rewards process so that if she, you know, does all of these things that she has to do, if she, you know, gets herself get ready, gets herself packed, brushes her teeth or whatever the things is that you want her to do, that there is some kind of tangible reward that it would be meaningful to her at the end of that. Doesn't have to be big, doesn't have to be expensive. OK, so, you know, let's be wary of that. Um, let's think about visual reminders. We talked about um impaired work in memory so it's about having visuals around the home about what it is that you know that she needs to do maybe before she gets set you know before she leaves the house in the morning to go to school maybe she ticks it off um, I always would suggest that there's one right by the, the door that she leaves to the front door as she goes out so that she can just go through as she got everything in her bag that she needs for today there could be one in the bathroom there could be one in the bedroom and try and do as much as you can the evening before for get her into a routine of you know packing and getting ready but I'm thinking when you said brushing teeth for example I'm talking you know we're talking about in the morning aren't we when you're when you're rushed um etc so let's think about using a reward process to support her but also many many people with ADHD talk about responding to things very visually um, and the art the theory is that this compensates for poor or working memory so um, have a have a visual sheet for her um, and but make it active you know have a have a pen or something that she can just tick off or cross off so she actually has to do something when she's completed all of the things have pictures with words as well don't just use words um, and you know make it very very visual if she's got to do you know if she's got to um let's say get washed and then put on a uniform obviously after she's been washed then if there's an order to the activities you know use arrows you know to make it really clear what she has to do one thing after another and also you know model it yourself 
um, I'm sure you do, that you are very organized and you've got everything sorted and you have a routine that you go to, go through, encourage other members of your family to do, to do the same, uh, to the same thing, but regular feedback all the time. Every time she does it right, make sure that you specifically comment on that and praise her and give her feedback because this that's where the reward um the um the dopamine as a reward based neurochemical comes into it she will need more i'm sure you know this more constant and regular feedback than neurotypical youngsters so you know and always be specific don't say, oh, you've done great this morning. You did everything right this morning. Be really specific because that generalized praise, they go through it really quick. So make sure it's, oh, you did well. You got your, you got your uniform organized. You brushed your teeth. You remember to pack your bag. Be very, very specific. And then reward her at some point for doing this. Good luck with that. Okay, thanks, Colin. I'll just try and squeeze one last question in. We've had so many right. that have come through, and um, so I've tried to keep as no a note as much as I can of, of all the ones that have been flying in. Um, but this is this will be our final one for today. So, um, my daughter is diagnosed with ASD and ADHD. How likely is it that her siblings will also have ADHD? And um, this parent has concerns about her seven-year-old son. Okay, great question. Thank you very much. Well, we know that ADHD runs in families. Uh, we do. Um, this, the research would suggest, um, I've seen as high as 70%, as low as kind of 50%. Um, so there is, a high, there is a high chance that um, that your seven-year-old um, might may have ADHD and or autism. Obviously, don't quote me on that. I'm not, you know, I'm not a pediatrician. I can't diagnose your seven-year-old, uh, but I can tell you that it, uh, there is a, a genetic component um, to ADHD. What's been fascinating in the last few years, and it's just, che it just cheers my heart, really, is the number of um, parents who've come to their own diagnosis through their sons or daughters um, and they 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 learn and they understand that it's that it's uh, hereditary um, and, and they get a diagnosis for themselves uh, so yeah the answer to that is yes there is uh, there is a um, there is a familial link and genetic link with uh, with ADHD and autism so if you have got concerns about your seven year old then I would suggest you know, um, you know, either go to the GP, talk, go to the school, talk to the Senko, start a process, move, you know, start moving on this um, if you have got concerns. Good luck. Thanks, Colin. Um, well, that was just absolutely fantastic. So many lovely comments coming in about how useful everybody has found it. So thank you ever so much for your time today. Um, and so that brings us to the end of our session. I'd like to say a big thank you.